elementary age, you can go next door. God is good. Amen. God is good. All right. We're going to get right into our text here this morning, share with you the Word of God. I, You know, if God is not challenging you to be bigger, better, stronger than you are right now, it might be because you aren't willing to accept the challenge. Because we are in critical days, and critical days has critical demands. And God is challenging people to step up and to be stronger than they have ever been before. The Bible said that God's people shall do exploits. And that's where we are commissioned to do. We are not commissioned just to be religionist. We are not commissioned just to be professors. We are, we are commissioned to be demonstrators. Amen. We should be demonstrators. People have learned that by being demonstrators, they get things done. They turn things upside down in their world when they learn the value of getting together and demonstrating. And people get a response from that. So here this morning, I believe that God is challenging every one of us to take some big steps and to step out into some arenas that we have not been in before and to do some things that we have not done before. And we are on the brink of great and exciting and powerful things that God wants to accomplish. The Bible said that when the spirit of iniquity doeth work. Now, iniquity is actually a choice of the individual to rebel against the principle of God. And so, when iniquity doeth abound, the grace of God doeth much more abound. I'm taking you this morning to the book of Amos and the book of Amos chapter 7. And I want to read some verses for you here this morning because the Word of God is demanding and calling on you and calling upon me to step out into some positions that might be out of our comfort zone. If you never step out of your comfort zone, you will never become bigger and stronger than you are right now. You'll always be where you've always been if you're not willing to step out of your comfort zone. If you aren't willing to pursue something bigger, something more dynamic in your future than what you have in your past, expect your future to be where you were yesterday because that's as far as you are going to go. Wherever you are in your job profession, you should always be looking at the upstep. You should always be looking at what you can become if you will put a little extra energy into that. You don't have to be at an entry level. You don't have to be on the bottom. You could be moving up. If you are working in a business and uh, you, are, you are watching and learning that business, if, let's say you're working at an insurance company, what you should be doing, you should be right now looking to position yourself to have your own office. You shouldn't be looking at 25 years from now. I may be able to retire from this place. You ought to be looking at owning that place or having your own thing going for you. Amen. Are you, are you with me this morning? Always be challenging yourself to something more than where you are right now or you'll never go any further than where you are right now. I want to challenge you, and I believe that God challenges us in our walk with Him to become better tomorrow than we were today. Let me read for you, beginning in Amos chapter 7, verse 7. Thus saith God, uh, thus saith, uh, thus he showed me, or God showed me, uh, behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, 
what seest thou? And he said, I see a plumb line. And he said unto the Lord, Behold, I set a plumb line in the midst of the people of Israel. I set a plumb line in the midst of those people. And I will again pass by them, will not pass by them any more. Now, uh, I asked Lephus to bring me uh, a plumb line that I knew Harley used to have one years ago. Uh, a lot of, a lot of before this uh, age that we're in today, building has always gone on. You go into some of the historical uh, areas of the world. You go into Europe or uh, Israel or Egypt or some of those old countries. You'll find buildings that have been built there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Those buildings were not put up by the usage of levels and things like that that carpenters have used in the last hundred years. They didn't have that kind of stuff. But what they did have, they had a plumb line. And that plumb line looked like this. And what they would do, they would set something and they would hang that plumb line. And that plumb line would, uh, would show the picture of where something square would be. Now, when that settles down there and quits moving, it will be exactly up and down. There won't be any play to it. There won't be any deviating to the right or to the left. And so they didn't build a building thinking, I've got a good eye and I believe I can see that out there and I think I can get that corner plumb. They used a plumb line. And that plumb line was to show them whether or not that building was set on the square or not and whether it was built right. <coughs> and and uh, in some of the buildings, especially in masonry work and stone work today, they still use a plumb line quite a bit. Not so much in carpentry, but in, in masonry work, they still use it a lot. But if you go back into the 1800s and back into those age, they didn't have levels. And they didn't have stuff that we have today. And they used primitive devices. And so the Bible said that God showed Amos a vision. And what he showed him was a plumb line. Because that plumb line is always going to be on the straight up and down. It's never going to veer a half inch to the right or a half inch to the left. It's always going to be on the exact up and down. It's going to be just where it's supposed to be. And so the prophet of God uh, looked at what God had and the Bible said God showed him a plumb line. And the Amos questioned God about it. And when the reply came back, here's what God said, I have set a plumb line on the people of Israel. In other words, I have set what the right up and down is. I have already determined determine the way it's supposed to be. I've already settled the fact that this is the way it's got to be and there won't be any deviating from it. And the Lord said, I won't be back now to talk to you about it. There won't be any negotiating. There won't be any trying to replan things and uh, this is the way it is. Now, when God gave us the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord became our plumb line and God won't deviate away from the Word of God. That plumb line sets the exact, the exact space and the exact place and the exact way that things are to be done. If I took a two-by-four out here this morning and I stood that out here before you, I could eye that up and I could say, well, I believe that's perfectly straight up and down. But the fact is, by the time you got up to that eight foot, you might be a half inch off quarter inch off, but you're not going to be exact. You're going to be uh, maybe close, but you're not going to ever be exact because you can't see things exactly. And the reason that God used a plumb line is that he wanted us to understand that in our religious pursuits and in our walk with God, we can never use our own thinking to determine whether or not we're right with God. We've got to come back to the book and we've got to ask ourselves, according to the book, now is this what God is expecting out of my life? You see, you might be able to do a lot of stuff and feel like I'm okay doing this and I don't feel condemned 
I don't feel bad about doing it. And so uh, I just go on my way because I think that everything is all right. Well, here's a problem with that. See, the Bible said, if the word of God condemns us, we are condemned already. Whether we feel it or we don't feel it, we've got to come back to the word of God. If you believe that, you've got a, an applaud here this morning because God is good. Amen. There has got to be some incentive in our life to be willing to fight for the challenges that are before us. That sends us out into the arena that says, God, I accept your challenge to take a big step and to go where other people may not be willing to go, to do what they're not willing to do. I look back into history, and when I go back to 1517, there were a lot of monks and, and priests that served in the Catholic Church in 1517. But it wasn't just everybody that would hear the voice of God speak to them as God was speaking to a young monk by the name of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther in 1517, uh, history documents to us, went in to visit with the Pope and found him inside of the, of the treasures of the Church of Rome and he's going through all of the wealth that they had, which was an abundance of wealth. When the Pope was found in there, he turned to Martin Luther and he said, Mr. Luther, no longer can we say silver and gold have we none. And Martin Luther looked back to him and quoted the rest of the scripture. He said, yes, sir, you are right. No longer can we say silver and gold have we none, but no longer is the church equipped with the power to say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Amen. Now, you can't gauge your rightness with God by what you have by the world's standards because the world's standards are not right. But Mr. Luther started a great period of reformation to bring the church back to what it was in the book of Acts and to bring the church into a state of spiritual restoration with God. Men like John Wesley, that in the year of 15 or 1750, some 233 years after Martin Luther, started what was uh, the movement of the Methodist church because he believed that there was an experience with God that went beyond just simply committing yourself to God and being repentant of your sin, that there was what he called a second blessing that a person could receive. And back in earlier documentation of the early Methodist church, it was not an unusual phenomenon for the Holy Spirit of God to fall and for them to be anointed with the Spirit of God and documented in the pages of the Methodist church and restored back into their documentation of of the 20 and 21st century, the Holy Ghost fell among them and they spoke in tongues and quivered under the power and the anointing of God. Why? Because there was a man that challenged the system of that day and said, I'm willing to take a big step and to move out of where I am and to step on this thing all by myself in order to exalt the word of God. It doesn't matter if my family appreciates it whether they like it or not, I'm going to step out to go a degree further than what others are willing to go. There are some people that are willing to make some big steps for Jesus. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? There are some people willing to make some big steps. Praise God. I remember when I was a young man, uh, just a, a late teenager, and I had a lot of great opportunities before me I had a lot of great opportunities and but when the spirit of God began to move into my life I walked out of those opportunities that could have been very lucrative opportunities in fact could have possibly brought thousands and millions of dollars in but I walked away from that and gave that up not necessarily now that I look back that I would have had to but I was willing in order to be in compliance to the move of God in that day, I was willing to walk away from that in order 
to be able to go a step further. Now, God has brought us a long way. And unless we're a person that's willing, like the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, a Jew, that was out massacring members of the church because he hated the name of Jesus. And he was had letters in his pocket that any Christian believer he found, he was to put them to death. And Paul saw, as he was known then, until the 8th chapter of Acts, Saul was a great persecutor of the church. He hated the name of Jesus. He was noble in the nation of Israel. He had a high polished name among the people of Israel. In fact, life could not have been better or more pleasant for anyone than it was for Saul of Tarshish. But one day on the road of Damascus, he met face to face a man named Jesus that would transform his life turn him around and change him from everything that he has been up to there. And when he met this man, he not only was changed in, in, internally, even God changed his name from Saul to Paul because Saul was a Jewish name and Paul was a Gentile name. And God was going to use this man to go among the Gentiles and to bring the gospel to them. Now the cost was great. Because he gave up vocation, he gave up fame, he gave up everything, even his family, in order to walk with God. Because as it appears in the scripture, Saul lost his wife, perhaps his children, and everything that he had in his pursuit of God, in walking after God. And so he probably went through a very horrible, horrible divorce situation because his wife would not leave the Judaism, to come to follow after Jesus. And he became faithful to what he was. Amen. See, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. And one of the requirements for a man to be a member of the Sanhedrin was that he had to have a wife and he had to have a family. And so Paul lost all of that. And, and, uh, but he was willing to do everything in order to make another step, a big step for the call of God. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm glad he made that big step because that big step that he made included the Gentiles, which is you and me, and brought us into the kingdom of God. And he wrote 14 books in this New Testament and left us an instruction and left us a design that if we want to follow after God, the way of God is not hard for the believer. The way of God is hard for the transgressor. And I found out many years ago, the harder you live for God, the easier it is. And when you try to live easy for God, it's hard. It's total devotion or it's nothing because the plumb line will not change. And God said, I have set the plumb line and I will not come back. This is it. It's there. It's written. It's in granite. It's in stone. I will not move it. I will not change it. It's here forever, and the Word will judge the world. Give him praise all over the house today. <clears throat> Are we willing to face and step out to do what needs to be done? In our nation went under into a horrible experience in 1929, we went into what was called the Great Depression. Men by the thousands committed suicide. Some jumped out of huge, enormous buildings. Some shot themselves. Some overdosed. They died by the thousands because in a moment of time, their wealth was gone. Our nation nearly starved to death. People that did not live in rural communities, folks in the country like us, they weren't affected nearly as drastically by it because they had grounds to plant food on and to be able to survive on. But people that lived in cities, that all they had was concrete and blacktop, those folks nearly starved to death. And many of them did starve to death during the Great Depression in the days of Hoover as a president. But then came Roosevelt. And Roosevelt ran for the presidency in 1932 to take the office in the spring of 1933, and his platform was very simple. What he said was this, I pledge to you and I pledge to myself that there will be a new deal for the American people. I was 
talking just about a week ago to Sheila, and I said, I wonder if Roosevelt really even knew what the New Deal was. But it, that was his theory. We're going to take on a new deal, and we're going to do something different to transform this great nation of ours. I'm talking about men this morning that was willing to step out and make a big step in order to change the world around them. How, how much, how uh, big of a step are you willing to take? Now, Roosevelt ran under that campaign, and at his inauguration, he requoted and retold them, we're going to administratively change, and I make that pledge to the American people, and I make that pledge to myself that we're going to change this nation that we're in. When he uh, took office immediately, all, 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 almost immediately, he began to change things like the banking reform laws and the emergency relief programs that we enjoy today during catastrophic events like tornadoes and, and hurricanes and great events like that. And work relief programs he put into place and WPA he put out there to be able to take people off the streets and put them in government jobs in order to redevelop and to recreate the nation. And then he brought a second new deal. And that second new deal many of us enjoy today, the Social Security Act, because there was no benefit for older people back in those days. If you were left as a person 65, 70 years old or broken down in health, if you didn't have family that would take you in and family that would take care of you, you were sent to a county house somewhere and you lived in a place of horrible, horrible conditions. Now, what I'm here to tell you this morning is that people that are willing to step out and take a big step for God are people that are changers in the world around them. Amen. And it, 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 I'm not sure that we have enough people today. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. Are we willing to work to change the world that is around us today? Our world is in danger. Our world is in trouble. And we need to make a big step. We need to be like a Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement that went out to defend the rights of black churches and Jewish synagogues and make a big step toward the movement of the civil rights of America. It was a horrible day back in the days that he started the civil rights movement. Blacks were allowed to go into the war and fight to defend this great nation of ours, but yet they were not allowed to play in a baseball league. They were allowed to die in combat next to a white man, but he could not sit down at a table and eat with him. I'm telling you that we've come a long way, but we didn't get to where we are just because time has taken us there. It's because there were some men and some women in history who have said, I'll take the big step and I'll take the responsibility of trying to change the world and make it a better place. And whatever I need to do, if it costs me finances, if it costs me fame, or it costs me my life, I'm willing to pay the price to make a difference in the world around me. How about you this morning? Are you willing to pay that kind of a price? Amos is challenged by God. He is challenged by God to take a big step. He is challenged by God to go out and to prophesy judgment against a nation. And God shows him a plumb line. And God says, this is the way it is. It's a straight line in the middle of the people. And he said, I'm not going to come back. I'm not going to renegotiate with you. I'm not going to try to resettle boundaries with you. This is the way it is. My word is forever settled in heaven. I have spoken it and I've given it to you. And it's a matter of your obedience or rejection of the word of God. Amen. Sometimes we find, uh, sometimes God challenges people today to take some big steps for him. It was a big step for uh, the prophet Amos when he heard God say, go prophesy against the king and go prophesy against the land of Bethel because they have rejected the word of God. The same message is true today for every believer that sits on these seats and every believer that sits on seats throughout this world. God has already set down the plumb line. God has already said, this is the way it is. I will not deviate. 
I will not move away from where I have established the church to be. I will not take truth away. I will not accept you in your neglect or rejection of truth. I have given you a plumb line here this morning, friend. I'm here to tell you that you need to, you need to seek after God and see what God has for your life because there is a truth that is calling and commissioning men and women today. Make a big step for God. Totally committed, totally dedicated to his cause. Hallelujah. Are we willing to make that kind of a stand? When Amos stepped out and began to prophesy against the land of Bethel, when Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, heard what that he was saying, he jumped right on Amos and he said to Amos, I want you to get out of here. I don't want you to ever prophesy in the land of Bethel together. Uh, uh, again, I don't want you to do that. Amos, Amos uh, 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 stood clear. Amos said, I, I think these are, are great words that Amos spoke because at this time, this prophet of God was not feeling that he was qualified to be doing what he was doing. Listen, there are men of God that have done great, wonderful works for God who can hardly read their name on a piece of paper. They don't have their degrees. They don't have their college education. And I'm, you know that I'm certainly in favor of that. I push everybody needs to go to college. If you're 40 years old and you don't have a degree, you ought to be doing it one step at a time. Hallelujah. I, I just this past semester started to go back and start taking more classes myself because I believe that you need to keep your mind working and always be growing and always be developing. I received a PhD in 1981. That's not enough. There's another class to take. There's another thing to develop. If you don't push yourself to go beyond where you are, you'll die in the same shoes you're wearing today. Push yourself to be more than what you are. Hallelujah. Now, folks don't like that because they want to get in their comfort zone, wrap their four walls around them, close and lock their doors and say, don't disturb me. But I'm here to tell you that you need to be disturbed. You need to get up and to become more than what you are right now. Look at what God says about him, or what Amos says about himself. I'm no prophet neither a prophet's son. I'm just a herdsman. I'm a dresser of the sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from, the, uh, from following the flock, and the Lord said, go. And that's all that Moses had to tell him. He said, I don't have a, a lot of things going for me. There are some things that God has challenged me to do that I don't feel equipped to do it. You, God may be telling you to go to your neighbor and to have prayer for them. There are things that happen. I looked the other day. I was reading uh, some post on, on Facebook and I saw this lady had put on there and she said, I am cancer free for so many years. I don't remember the number of years, but I remember when she was battling that cancer. I stopped her on the football field over there with a football game going on, all kinds of noises. I ran down, I saw her walking across the, uh, the, the track where they run. And I had been wanting to see her because she had been diagnosed with cancer. I ran down there and I said, I want to have prayer for you. And she said, we, you, when do you, uh, we'll get together. I said, well, no, I'm going to have prayer for you right now. Noise everywhere, all over that track. I'm here to tell you. I laid my hands on her. I began to pray for her and pour my heart out to God. And by the time that prayer was over, you could have almost heard a pin drop in that football game. Everything stopped. The game stopped. Everything stopped. I'm here to tell you that God is looking for some folks that will make a drastic stand. But I'm telling you this one thing. She's been cancer free from that day to this. God is good. God is good. God is good. And we need to make those kind of steps for God. See, the Bible said not many wise after the flesh and not many mighty and not many noble are called. God is not looking for nobility. God is not looking for the wise and intellects of the world. What God is looking for is a man or a woman that will step out in faith and say, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus. More than that. If God can take a little boy that has nothing in his, in his favor but a slingshot and defeat a giant, what could God do with you? 
If God could take a child that was walked off and left by his parents on a riverside and grew up to be a murderer by the name of Moses and use him to lead three million men and women and children out of bondage into the land of Canaan, what should God be able to do with you? If God can take a poor Jewish carpenter boy and justifi who justifiably uh, claimed himself to be a savior of the world, if God could use that, what can God do with you? God took 12 nobodies and turned the world upside down with the gospel of Jesus. There is no secret what God can do in your life if you're willing to take a big step in faith and follow after Jesus. No limit to what God can do. Come on, folks, are you with me this morning? Hallelujah. I want to challenge you. You've got to take a big step for God. Now, I want to also tell you this, that when God challenges you to take that big step, Remember, you're not in a popularity contest. It's not a personality contest because everybody won't go with you. I'll never forget, when I first started seeking after God, I got hungry for God. God had just had come into my life. I, I didn't know enough about God to, I, I couldn't have quoted, I only knew one or two scriptures in the whole Bible that I really knew. And uh, one of them was I'd learned in a Baptist Sunday or a Baptist RA's class, and, and it was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I knew where it was. I didn't know where Acts was, but I knew where Acts 16.31 was. I could quote that verse, although I didn't know, I couldn't have told you how many books were in the Bible. I couldn't have told you whether Acts was in the New or the Old Testament. I didn't know anything about that. But one thing I knew, if I could believe on God, I could be saved. I could follow after him. I could know him. And I came to know Jesus. When I came to know God, I thought everybody I knew would come to know God. I thought everybody would want this. I, I mean, I just believed that I would just have to haul carloads of friends to the church. Guess what? It didn't work that way. It didn't work that way at all. I would go to the table with my parents, and they would go to the table to eat, and I would be fasting sometimes for days at a time, sometimes 10, 12, 15, sometimes 25 days at a time and never eat a bite. And I would go to the table with them because I felt that's what I needed to do. I've seen my dad take his table, his, his plate and push it back and says, I'm not going to eat at this table with him. And I would sit there and I didn't know where I fit. I didn't know what to do. Oh, my dad was not a Christian. My mother was not a Christian. That was in, in, in uh, the 1960s. But in 1969, I had the privilege of seeing my mother come forward and to give her heart to God. And to, I baptized her in the precious name of Jesus. And God filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues. I kept praying for my dad. Oh, God, I want my dad to be saved. I want my dad to serve you. I want my dad to live for you. And my dad would almost run from me. We were, I'd always loved my father, and, but he would almost run from me because he didn't know, he couldn't understand what this was all about. Oh, but one day on a Sunday afternoon, he left here to go back to Louisville. And on his way home to Louisville, he's driving up 62, and he got to where the high bridge there is right before you get into Big Clifty. And all of a sudden, he felt this enormous pain in his chest. And he got out of his car. There used to be a picnic table sitting there. And my dad got out, and he laid down on that table. And he later told me, he said, I thought I was dying that day. I didn't think I would ever survive to get off of that table that day. And, but he laid there for a few hours and got the feeling better. It wasn't but just a day or two later, my dad came to the church, walked down the aisle for God, repented of his sin. I baptized him in Jesus' name, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, let me tell you, if you'll make a step for God and make a stand for God, it will give you rewards that the world cannot give you. It's all about Jesus and not about us. It's all about him. See, sometimes we make a big step and we think, wow, everybody is going to want this, but, but it doesn't happen that way. In fact, if you look at the record and you look at the life of Moses or, or of Amos, you'll quickly recognize Amos was out by himself. Nobody went with him. They didn't follow him. They didn't want what he had to say. See, when God challenges you, to take, challenges you to take a big step, some's going to walk away from you. They're, they're not going to want to walk 
with you. They're going to walk away from you. And sometimes the one closest to you will desert you. They'll walk away because they don't understand. We got to get ready when you make a step for God. You got to get ready for some character assassination to start. People will tell stories on you. They will make up stories about you. They'll do all kinds of things that are against you. Amos said, man, I'm in trouble with this. I'm a sheep holder, and God's calling me out here to do this, and I'm a sheep holder. I don't know how to do this. I'm a sheep holder. I don't have pro prophetic credentials. I'm not ordained as a prophet of God. I'm not among the courts of the priests. And what do I do, and where do I go from here? Amaziah said to him, you better get out of Bethel and go back down to your city because if you stay in Bethel, we're going to kill you. We don't want you here. You don't prophesy anymore in Bethel. But there is a problem. See, God said, go to Bethel and prophesy against the wickedness of the people. Now, who do we heed this morning? Are you going to follow the command of your husband or the command of your wife or the wishes of your children or, or the wishes of those around you? Are you going to make a stand for God? Are you going to make a stand for God? Are you going to stand for money or God? Are you going to wish for prestigiousness or God? Are you going to be seeking popularity or God? I'm here, I'm here to tell you with all absolute assurance this morning that if you want God, it's going to cost you some things as far as the world is concerned. It's going to cost you. I kind of feel like the prophet John the Baptist who said, what did you go out to see this morning? A wind shaken in the reed? I don't understand a lot of things. I know that there are much greater preachers than I. I know there are much people much smarter than I. But God put a call on me and challenged me to do what I wasn't comfortable with. See, I never liked I never liked the front stage of anything. When I would go to school as a child and they would say if you don't get up and do this or make this statement or, or make or, or, or re, you know, you, you've got to memorize this and tell the story or if you don't tell your book report or you don't, then we're going to give you an F and I would have to go to them and I would say to my teacher if you want to give me an F, you can give me an F. If you want to fail me, you can fail me. But if, if you're expecting me to stand before people, I can't do it. That's not me. That's not, I can't do that. I can't tell you through the years when I've preached conferences and camp meetings where there's thousands and thousands of people. And I've stood in places like Convention Center and Freedom Hall and places like that where there's 15, 18,000 people and preach to those people and I can't tell you the two or three times before I would get up there that I would be so nervous I'd have to step out the back run to the restroom, throw up and come back and think I'm okay but then have to go again because I couldn't I, it just wasn't me I didn't want to do that but sometimes God challenges us out of our comfort zone he takes us where we don't fit and puts us where he wants us because we're what he's looking for. We're what, we're what he is looking for. I don't, I don't understand God. I don't understand God's ways. But I don't have to understand him. I just have to believe him. I can't tell you this morning how salvation works, but I believe it works. You know why that I believe it works? Because my life was in trouble when I came to God. My life was in trouble. I was, I was tied into a lot of stuff. I had a lot of opportunities, but I was tied into a lot of stuff. If you're talking about you've got an addiction and you don't know what to do with it, I'm here to tell you that there is no weekly counsel that is needed to get out of it. Now, if you need that, that's fine. 
But I'm telling you that when I got touched by the blood of Jesus, immediately all of that was gone. I never, never wanted that anymore. I never, never went back on those trails anymore. I have found Jesus to be enough. <coughs> I found him to be enough. <clears throat> he was there when I was sick. And God took all of that away. Now, I'm not telling you this morning that if God doesn't take away all your sickness, that, that you're not where God wants you to be. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm telling you that I found Jesus to be enough. Houses and lands I may not own. Riches I don't have. I don't have that stuff. But I do have a God, a God that loves me and a God that cares for me. God, I thank you this morning. I thank you, God, because when I was a young man, you came into my life and, and you gave me a purpose. You, you molded me with an ambition. God, you did for me what others could not do. You helped me, God, when I didn't know how to help myself. And I believe in this building this morning, Lord, that there are people that you're dealing with their lives and you love them. You love them so much that the very thing that you desire is for them to bow into your presence and to accept you as the Lord, the Lord of their life. I thank you, God, for every visitation. I thank you for the angelic visitations I thank you God for the day to day walk when it's, when it's not something as drastic as a visit of an angel you're still there whether I feel you or not I always sense you're there blessings and power and anointing I thank you God for coming to me where I was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wherever you are this morning, Jesus is enough. I remember walking onto the baseball field and trying out for the AAA team and I remember the letter of acceptance and when the opportunity would have been there. But between the time of the tryout and the letter, I met Jesus and I knew there was a new trail. I was coming up strong in the profession of bowling. By that time, I was on TV a few times and I don't talk about that stuff much, but just recently I started back bowling some, and I, I love that sport. And what I was amazed was I still carry a far higher than most professionals carry. I still carry, I'm still carrying a 224 average, which is high. Opportunities are there, but walking with Jesus outweighs all of that. If you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what would you give in exchange? As we stand together in this building, wherever you are and whoever you are, the invitation is to you to come. Will you step out and will you come right now?